All right, let's give it up for our kindergarten and first graders. You guys are awesome. All right, you guys can head off back then. Good morning and welcome to Kensington. How many of you guys are here to cheer on one of these guys in our performance today? Awesome. <laughs> They've got some fans, that's awesome. Well, good morning. Um, my name is Renee Mullenix and I am our lead director of our Kaleo Kids program. And we just wanna let you know, if you're new here and you have kids, we have incredible kids programming here at Kensington. Every Sunday morning, we have um, programming for birth through fifth grade. And so if you wanna know more about that, we have a, a desk right by that fun orange slide. Um, go check it out. You can take a tour of our kids wing or ask questions, we'd love to have you back. Now, today is the first of a three-week series that we're kicking off today called The Backwards Way. And it's totally fitting that we are putting the service in the hands of kids, because that's kind of backwards. You know, society says, you know, to have influence, you have to have money and status and power, but Jesus just described it as faith like a child. So we're really excited to have them lead us today. And really, that's what makes Kaleo Kids so unique and special. It's an arts program for elementary school kids, but it's even more than that because every week the kids are learning that their identity is a child of God, that they are deeply loved, that he has a plan for their life, and all these gifts and talents that they have are meant to be used as a blessing for others. And so when kids start learning that, and that's their foundation, it really can change the trajectory of their life. So if that excites you, and you'd like to get involved, or you know a child you'd like to register, we do have spots open for our next session. It begins at the end of January. It's called the Heroes of Gaynog, and it's a virtual reality theme Kaleo. So I think the kids are going to like that. And if you didn't know, here at Troy, we have two different locations for you. We have a Wednesday night location that meets upstairs here at Troy campus at 630. And that cast of kids is who you're going to see perform today. But we also have added a second location. It meets on Thursdays offsite at West Utica Elementary School. And that cast performed yesterday, which was really fun. And that location is special because the kids from that school are invited to participate in Kaleo with us. So it's it's a really neat partnership. So if you have questions, um, please check our table out in the lobby. We'd love to meet you and tell you more about it. Now, before the kids come out to perform, we do want to tell you about something exciting here at Kensington, right around the corner, our Christmas services. So check out this video. Over 2,000 years ago, there was a king who was strong, mighty, and wealthier than any other king in the land. His kingdom was placed on top of a mountain where the rest of the world was overshadowed by his power. But to the king's dismay, another king entered the world. Jesus, baby Jesus that is, came to earth. There were angels singing and even a giant star in the sky. But was it a big, shiny, and beautiful entry? Let's discover the large, life-changing truths hidden in the Christmas story. Good morning, everyone. Hope you guys are all doing well. And as we saw, this is what we're going to be uh, focusing on this Christmas. And it's the tale of two kings or the story of two kings who were very, very different. And one king, a baby king, would ultimately, through his life here on this earth, would change the course of human history. And so that's what we're going to be looking at this Christmas. And our Christmas services, is crazy to think, are only three weeks away. And we'd love for you not only to come, but also this is a great opportunity for us to also reach out to family members, friends, neighbors and co-workers and to invite them as well and if you're one of the great ways that you can actually invite someone is if you look into your programs or open up your programs you'll see sort of a tear off right there and has all the information about our Christmas services and you can just tear that off and give that to someone and that's a great way to invite them as well but if you're planning to be here, if you're planning to bring someone as well, all you have to do is go to our app or you can go to our website and all the service times are located right there. And we also just would ask that just go to the app or go to the website and grab free tickets as well because we have 43 services across our campuses. We're expecting more than 45,000 people to come through our doors that weekend. And so to accommodate everyone, we're just asking um, people just to grab those free tickets which can be very, very easily accessed. But another great way to invite people is via social media. And 
we would like, this is where we would like your help and to jump in. And so if you're somebody who loves social media, who is social media savvy, we'd love for you to help us get the word out as to what's going on here at Kensington over Christmas. And so if you'd like more information about this or if you wanna jump into this opportunity, all you have to do is go to the app or you can go to our website, kensingtonchurch.org forward slash ambassadors and you can find out everything there. Also, on December 12th, we're going to have our last midweek of the year. And what midweek is, it's a service that happens on the second and fourth Wednesdays right here at Troy at 7 o'clock right here in this room. And it's an opportunity for us as a community to get together, to be able to worship and sing together, and also to hear a powerful message so that we could be refreshed and recharged and go out into the week and through our lives communicate Jesus to the people around us. But this coming midweek, which is on December 12th, is going to be a special one in that during that midweek, we're going to be telling the Christmas story through songs, through music, as well as through the reading of scripture. And so we'd love for you to come, bring somebody with you. We're going to have hot chocolate. We're going to, we're going to have cookies out in the lobby. So it's going to be a really festive environment. Environment. So we'd love for you to be a part of that. Jalen and Michael are preparing really, really, they've done such a great job preparing for that. And it's going to be a very, very special night. And I'm going to, in a moment, I'm going to invite all of you to stand up and say hello to somebody uh, around you. But before you do, after our crunch, the kids are going to come out and they're going to be telling us an incredible story about a young girl named Annabelle who learned a very, very important lesson in a backwards way. But before we get to that, how about we all stand up and say hello to each other? bloomed beauty can be hard to come by have you ever felt like a lion with no roar when everything seems silent have you ever felt like a leopard with determination dedication and destination no that doesn't make sense Desensitization? No. I don't even know what that means. Deliberation. That means thinking, right? Yes, perfect. Deliberation. And that is why I should be the next class president. Oh, hey everyone. I'm really glad you're here because today is really important. The most important day of my life, probably. Today, our class is voting for the next class president. And I am what they call a total shoe one. Because you see, this is me. And I'm really smart. No, not that smart. I haven't graduated yet. I make a great older sister. I usually get checked to be the teacher's helper. Not because I'm the teacher's pet or anything. I just pay attention and I know what to do. And let's be honest, I am the teacher's pet. I usually get extra time in the iPads because I finish my work first. I usually get the best spot on the B-Bag during quiet reading. At recess, I usually get the only food that isn't bent out of shape. And I'm popular. I'm pretty much friends with everyone in our class and the other fake light classes too. I show determination, dedication, and deliberation. Let me tell you about me. Make a great class president. I got world class skill, first place thrill, and everyone's my friend. Chauffeurs, hors d'oeuvres, my mom bends to my will. I got a living made, got the bills all paid, and my juice box never spills. Let me tell you about me. Let me tell you about me. My, yo, me. Let me tell you about me. I'm the best. So popular, no stop. 
Wait, 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 freeze. What is going on here? You're a mess. I mean, I'm a mess. Okay, okay. There has been a big mistake or something because this is not how I normally look. This can't be happening, not today, out of all days. It's election day. How did I end up like this? Well, kid, you've had a bit of a backwards day. What on earth is a, whoa, who are you? Your fairy godmother. Obviously. Obviously. So this is your fault? Yes and no. Yes and no, right. Okay, so do you mind telling me what happened? Sure. You see, things went backwards right from the start. You see, your clock. What? Yup, and so it didn't ring quite when it was supposed to, so you were the last to get up. I'm never last. And for some reason, you could only walk backwards. Backwards? What? On earth? And your sister, she decides to take her time in the bathroom. Oh, what did she just? And your mom was already calling you kids to get breakfast. And you got the last waffle. Please tell me I didn't go to school looking like this. You did. <sighs> and in the car, you had to sit all the way in the back. I hate the back. Don't we all? Well, that just isn't fair. Who's that? That's Harry, your neighbor. Harry, ring a bell. No. Your mom's been driving him to school with you for the last year? been in your same class since kindergarten? No. You really don't remember Harry? Well, no. Well, let's see why that might be. Who had sit in the bath yesterday? <laughs> and what about the day before that? And the day before that. And what about okay, the day okay. before? I get it. I don't have to sit in the back a lot. It would seem hardly ever. The last time you sat in the back was eight months, 16 days, and three hours ago, to be exact. Well, I am the oldest, so I. So you deserve to sit in the front. Is that what you were going to say? Yeah. Doesn't sound that fair when I say it out loud. That kid is because it isn't, and that means you've never noticed Harry before? Yeah, that is pretty bad, isn't it? It's pretty bad, that's for sure. But don't worry, your day gets better. It does? I mean, a few weird looks from people when you walked in backwards, but you were kind of getting the hang of it. Though, during math, you kept getting answers mixed up, adding when you should have subtracted and the other way around. Lunch was a little messier, or... And art, well, let's just call it what it was. It was a disaster. I'm sorry. When does it get better? You said it got better. Please tell me it gets better. Hold your horse heads, we're getting there. Though during quiet reading, you didn't get a bean bag. But I always get a bean bag. Always, huh? Well, look who got it today. Harry, I don't get it. I always have my book ready, and I... Wow, he's really excited to be there. Sure is. You see, Harry's been having a pretty bad day up to this point, or a pretty bad week, or year, really. You see, Harry has to worry about things in his life that he shouldn't have to worry about. Oh. I never knew. You should ask him about it one time. He'll surprise you. Maybe I will. So this is my day gets better? Not quite yet. You see, next was the spelling test. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Everything I do doesn't seem to be the way Double. 
the worst day ever. Well, it's just about to get better. Harriet, how is he going to make my day better? Oh, give him a chance, Annabelle. What is he saying? I'm not too good at accents, so bear with me. Hey, Annabelle, what you doing? You're still bumming over that spelling test? Sure, I guess. That is not how I talk. I'm trying my best. Well, I saw you was having a bad day. You could say that. My, my painting, he fixed it. Why is he being so nice to me? Well, it's kind of backwards till you really think about it, but the best people are the helpers. They may not get star badges or be elected president, but they know people's names, know what's happening in their lives, and they help. The helpers, huh? And this is where I leave you. Here? Now? Can't you fix this? Nope, that's entirely up to you, kid. To do what? That's up to you. Thanks. For what? For showing me all this. You know, I always thought it was good to be first and best at everything, but maybe I have things a little backwards. Sure thing, kid. You know, it's not too late to turn things around. <laughs> hey, I'm the walking backwards and he I can take it from here. There are three qualities every president should have. Actually, I'm not really sure what qualities presidents should have, but I know what I wrote in this speech isn't the answer. Because you see, before today, I had everything a little backwards. I think a good class peasant should be a person who sees the people around them. They should know their name and what's going on in their lives. They should have a good example. But not by being first and best at everything, but by being a helper. And that is why I, that is why I think Harry should be our next class president. Okay. 
focused on me that I couldn't see what's actually going on. Spent all of my time to get first in line. Now I realize don't waste your time, baby, on things that make it hard to love, love, love. I used to think a winner Awesome, awesome, awesome job. Man, give them another hand. It's so good. Great job. So good. Now, I'll tell you, I absolutely love this program, and I want to tell all of you, and I told you last service, and I'm going to tell you next service, you really are today our priests, our pastors, our leaders. And I am so grateful for you, and you are so amazing. You're so powerful. And thank you for that, because they are leading us in the thought of our day. And so thank you. Give them another big hand as they walk off. Thanks. Great job. Great job. Good job. I just want to say thank you to Renee Mullenix and uh, the whole team, uh, Jenny Stewart, and a number of the leaders that, that are part of that, and all of the volunteers. Boy, I tell you what, I... This is one of my favorite times of the year. I love Kaleo and I love what it stands for. And I really do believe that that story of Annabelle plays so perfectly into our day. My name is Danny. If you're brand new here, welcome. Uh, we're grateful that you're here. But really the journey they took us on is gonna push us right into this new series that we're doing for the next three weeks called The Backwards Way. And that story of Annabelle, maybe you relate to it. I don't know. I know I certainly I, I do, but... She had this vision in her mind of how her life was going to go. I don't know if I, but you, but I have five, 10, 20 year plans. Do you? Have they ever worked out well? And not, not quite. But you have these dreams and these visions and, you, and your eyes focus on those. And that's all you see. And you keep going. You keep building your own life and your own kingdom. And all of a sudden, one day you realize that it's not happening. And as you're on that journey, you've missed out. And I love the fact that she has to move backwards. And as she moves backwards, a wider scene is there. And she starts to see people in the world and herself differently. 
That's great. And that last kind of main line in that last song, it said, don't waste your time on things that make it hard to love. Don't waste your time on things that make it hard to love. I've wasted a lot of my time. And when I heard that line, I thought, man, that's true. We waste a lot of time on things that make it hard for us to love others. And so that's what we're gonna look at. And this series is based on a book called Small Cloud Rising. It's about a pastor and a writer and entrepreneur, Dave Gibbons. And he started a church out in California years ago. He's a friend of Kensington. He's spoken here as well as our Orient campus. He's trained a number of us. And he started a church called New Song Church. It was the fastest growing church in California, actually in the United States, a multi-ethnic, multicultural church. And it was in the early 2000s, about 2005, they were having their Easter experience and something happened that changed. I'm gonna read his words from his book. He said this. For our Easter experience in 2005, we chose the Anaheim Convention Center. That's how big they were, which is so close to Disneyland, I could have thrown a rock and hit Sleeping Beauty's castle. The event would have made Walt proud. The Magic Kingdom and the Holy Spirit. Collectively, we wished upon a star and thousands of people streamed in, guided by parking attendants wearing large white Mickey Mouse gloves. And then he tells of this moment where he pulled back the curtains and he looked out at the crowd and there was just thousands of people feeling this convention center all for this one moment, this one day. And he felt like he heard the whisper that said this, is this it? Is this it? He describes it this way. He says, at the pinnacle of success, parallel to Disneyland, God asked me to look deeply into my motivations, my metrics, and methods. I had created a box, my own Babel, a kingdom with walls. We knew how to manufacture experiences and draw in thousands of spectators, but failed to impact our city by any meaningful measure. We grew vertically, but the city didn't change. The power of big was contained in a box. And then I felt God say to me this, and this is the question that's gonna really run with us over the next three weeks. He felt the question on his heart was this, what if the church wasn't contained to a piece of land? What if the church wasn't contained to a piece of land? Now, I hope you know this, uh, today we're, in, we're on a piece of land, we're in this box, but I hope you know that this isn't really church. I mean, it's a community and it's a gathering, but according to God, church is what? His people. So church happens 24 hours a day, seven days a week around the world. So what would church look like if it wasn't contained to a piece of land? What if each person understood God's heart for the world? What if each follower of Jesus understood their own unique abilities to reach the world using their gifts, their joy, their pain, their resources, their relationships? What if each person started to see themselves not as spectators, but of participants in God's mission? I don't know if you see yourself that way today. What if you could? What if we saw each other just like I really envision all of our students as, pe- uh, as pastors, as priests, as church planners? What if all of us realized that we have power and platforms provided by God to build his kingdom and not our own kingdom? That's what we're gonna look at over the course of the next three weeks as we're preparing ourselves for Christmas. Can you believe it's Christmas? Holy cow. How many of you are done with your Christmas shopping? Okay, you're the ones that I don't want to talk to and I don't like, but I haven't even looked at a present yet. But boy, I'll tell you something, it's coming quick, but we're prepping, and I think this three-week series is a perfect preparation for Christmas as we're going to talk about the tale of two kings, meaning Jesus entered in with a whole other instinct as a king and for his kingdom. In fact, my friend, Father Ken Tanner, he was here this past Wednesday. He said that God, who spoke the world into existence decided to enter into the world speechless as a baby. That's Christmas. And so we're gonna look at that, the dichotomy of the world and Jesus. But in this first week, right now, we're gonna look at how humans, us, we tend to build our own kingdoms rather than God's kingdom. And I think we're really gonna be looking at one word, which is pride. And as we continue, we're gonna receive our offering. If you are brand new here, I know there's a number of visitors uh, today. Thank you for being here. We're grateful that you're here 
This moment does not have to be your moment. If you wanna participate, awesome, but you don't have to feel any of that. Just so you know, if you're new, about 80% of our giving comes in online. So many of us give uh, online on our website, give through the app, we text. Uh, so just, just know that that's a reality in our community. And so we thank you for being a part of this. And I just want you to know too that uh, for Amy and I, we do this because we really believe in building God's kingdom in this world and not our own. So we really give back and it's an act of worship for us. So thank you, all of you that are part of that. Now here's what I know about humans and check me if I'm wrong. Humans love to build things and they love to compete. And I, they love to build and they, they love to compete. And one of my favorite events that happens every year, I've watched a ton of these videos, happens in Spain. It's called the building of the castells, the building of human towers. And so you see these amazing human towers. We got a picture of it. Now look at that. There's a stadium filled with people, all different regions of Europe. Now if you look in the bottom here, that circle, kind of teal circle, if you look closely, there's a whole tower of people coming up there. And uh, this is a major competition. I mean, they, it's, um, I, I grabbed the video because I wanted you to see, like, look at this. Isn't that unbelievable? Yeah, and, and, and obviously, the, look at the, the, who gets to go to the top, the kids, please. You know, I looked at this and I realized something. Uh, for me, there's only one place I would be in this competition. You wouldn't even see me. I'd be on the bottom. But look at that. She's like, we won. Isn't that incredible? And some of these towers go 10 stories high, 10 stories. Look, at, I, there's, a, there's a moment where we actually can see down from the very, very top where the little, the little girl is and, and they'll just look down on top of it and it's stunning, look at that. That's gotta be scary. That's gotta be scary, you're right. Now look, I, I'm, there was no way I was gonna show you the best ones which is when they all fall, but you know, you can go home and, and Google that. <laughs> now, I couldn't do that to you, but. It's awesome, and since the beginning of time, really and since the invention of steel and iron ore and all of this, humans have been in competition of building the tallest building. For many decades, we had the tallest building. Now, some of our tallest buildings are lesser. Now, the, the, the Empire State Building was built in 1931, is the 43rd tallest building at about 1,200 feet. Check out these pictures of that. And it's amazing what happens in there. <laughs> Look at that. I don't, I don't think OSHA standards were up there uh, too much. I love the next guy. He, he, there's literally zero connecting him to that tiny piece, right? And so that was in 1931. In 1974, the Sears Tower was built. OSHA came a little bit closer. They got at least one cable. That's the 21st tallest building at 1,450 feet. Uh, the sixth tallest building is also in the United States. It's the One World Trade Center. It's actually in uh, dedication to the Twin Towers. That one is actually 1,700, a little over 1,700 feet. The tallest building in the world is in Dubai. It's called the Burj Khalifa. Look at this. This is actually t over 2,700 feet tall. And that right there is a prince that has actually prince in that region that has climbed the spire and is taking, of course, a selfie. That's just awesome. It's like, look at me. I'm on the tallest place that humans have built. It's beautiful. But humans really have always had this desire to build, to compete, to win, to be considered the best, to be number one, to reach the skies, to build a name for themselves. And these images of skyscrapers and human towers and everything that our students taught us fold so beautifully into the scripture that we're gonna look at today that's found in the very first book of the Bible, Genesis. And this story is the first time in human history where humans tried to build a skyscraper. It's usually called the Tower of Babel, but let's look and see what God does this service. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and they had bitumen, which was like a tar, uh, kind of a slime that they would get out of pits for mortar. And they said, pay attention to this part. Come, let us build ourselves a city, a tower with its tops to the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we should be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth." And so humans had this concept or this plan for success that we see in this particular scripture. They say, let us build a city and then let us also build a tower 
so that everyone that sees the city and the tower will then praise us and build a name for themselves. And whatever we do, we're not gonna leave this place that we have control of. We're not gonna be scattered across the earth. That's their plan for success. But God has always had a different plan. In fact, if you go by just a couple more chapters before this, God's speaking to Noah and his sons. And he says to them, I'm going to bless you. And I want you to go and be fruitful and multiply. And then he says this, and then I want you to go and fill the earth. Say, fill the earth. Say it like you mean it. Say, fill the earth. One more time. That's God's plan. And by the way, God had this plan in the very beginning of time. The very first human being. He said, I want you to be fruitful. I'm going to bless you, multiply. And then I want you to go and say it again, fill the earth. Fill the earth. Thank you. Fill the earth. God has this plan that he wants his community to fill the earth. Not into a piece of land, not contained. He wants them to fill. Different plan. So let's look at the plan that humans usually have for success. And let's look at the contrary with God's. The human plan for success, number one, is what I can mine from the scriptures. The first thing is self-protection. It says, let us build ourselves a city. Humans tend to love security. I like it too. We tend to like security. And we build our own communities And they actually can become exclusive. And sadly, churches are the same. Can build churches and their own little exclusive communities. I know we've we've messed up there too. I'm sure we have. I'm sure we felt like people were excluded. In fact, one of the reasons that I love kaleo, actually even the word kaleo, the Greek word, it means to invite, to welcome. The whole concept and what I dream for this church and for our community is that every person, when they walk through the doors, feels welcome that you're welcome here. But many times we don't do that. We, we build these exclusive little places and people feel left out. We like to protect and we like to control. Tom Monahan, who owned Domino's Pizza, he's CEO there, he had a dream because he was so deeply entrenched in his, his faith, he wanted to build a city that was based off the principles of that faith and try to hold out the world's Values and hold tight into this small place in the city and hold just to the values of his faith. And so in the early 2000s, he actually built the city in Florida and he called it Ave Maria. It's awesome. And here's a picture of it. And there's the church is right in the center. Everything, there's a university there. Everything's built around it. So it's so interesting, isn't it? That we have this desire to control and to hold the world at bay, to not let it come close And then the times we're living right now, there's so much divisiveness, there's so much tension in this modern day time. I talk to many people and what they'll say to me is, I'm just trying to control this. I don't want my kids to be here. I don't want us to be here. I wanna make theirs, I wanna make theirs. And I keep saying to them, look, look at the example of Jesus. He leaves his, this is what we're gonna celebrate at Christmas. He leaves his perfect heavenly home. This absolutely perfect home to travel through time and space, to go near to his creation and enter into what? Enter into a broken circumstances, enter into imperfection, corruption. He enters in and he comes close. He doesn't, he's not distant. That's the beauty. He enters into our situation. He doesn't remove himself. He's not in self-protection mode. He's in the center of it. That's what God desires for us. But we, for our success, tend to be in self-protection. Second one is this, self-promotion. It says, let us build a tower up to the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves. We're gonna make a name for ourselves. Man, we are in a time right now of self-promotion, aren't we? There's so much self-promotion. And here are these people building their very first tower. This tower symbolizes ability and wealth and status, desire. You know what the desire is? To be God to be God, to be in control. And they are making a statement building this tower. They're making a name for itself. So I love what Dave Gibbons says about this. He says this, the building of Babel exhibits the motivation of the human heart to promote oneself against the welfare of others. In our desire to make a name for ourselves, we are more than content to rise on the backs of others. Now look, I wanna make something really, really clear. There's nothing wrong with building things. There's nothing wrong with wealth. 
Nothing. I remember years ago studying Buddhism, and uh, one of the teachers said to me, said to the class, he said something like, "There's nothing wrong with driving a Mercedes Benz as long as the Mercedes Benz don't drive you." And I thought it was so interesting. It's a principle of truth, and we find it in Scripture. It's really God's heart. He's saying, look, some of you in this room, men and women that are gifted at business and gifted at creating wealth, there's been some experts to say if we distributed the wealth evenly across the whole world, it would end in the, up into the hands of the 1% or 2% that are created to create wealth. There's nothing wrong with that. What's wrong with it is when we create it to bring ourselves all the promotion and the glory. That's where it breaks down. And the Bible warns of this. It says in Proverbs 27, it says, do not boast about tomorrow, for you don't know what a day may bring. Let an- Listen to this. Let another praise you, not your own mouth. Have you ever done that? Let, let another praise you, not your own mouth. A stranger and not your own lips. Wouldn't that be interesting to live our life that way? Never going to promote. I'm just going to rely on other people to say that I'm awesome. Our whole business plan for success as humans, self-protection, self-promotion, and then out of this scripture, I would take selfish pride. They say, no, 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 God, we're not gonna do it that way. We have our own. We know what we're doing. This is what we're gonna do. We have this pride about it, and we don't break it. We hold it. We don't wanna do, want do that because we don't wanna do what you want us to do, God. We wanna do it our own way. Billy Graham says it this way. Selfish pride shuts God out of our lives. Because it makes us believe we don't need him. This kind of pride puts self on the throne of our hearts instead of God. It leads to arrogance because it causes us to think we are better than others. It blinds us to our own faults and leads us to jealousy and conflict. It also makes us insensitive to the needs of others and causes us to control others instead of loving them. So we have this selfish pride. And you, you, I know you've heard this, you know, pride goeth before the... Fall, of course. We, we, we quote that a lot. The scripture says it this way. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And it is be, it's better to be lowly in spirit among the poor than to divide the spoil with the pride. So we know that every sin that we commit is rooted. Actually, I would say every single sin that's ever been commuted, uh, committed has been rooted in pride. This idea that we want to be God and not let God be God. So God has a whole nother plan. It's not self-protection, self-promotion, selfish pride. It's something very different. And I love God's response to the people of Babel as they're building this tower. This is his response. It said, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which mortals had built. I love that first line. Because look, if you've ever seen like the Hubble telescope and it goes out, you see how wide and huge the universe is. And here these humans are building this tower and like, look at what we built. And God, in the scripture says, hey, let's go down and see these guys. Let's go down and see this little tower that they built. It's so small compared to God. I love that first line. And the Lord said, look, they are one people, and they all have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there all over the face of what? The earth. And they left off the building of the city. Therefore it was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of, say, all the earth. One more time, all the earth. He came and he did what? He scattered them all over the earth. He said, my plan is not for one language and one person and you huddle up in your one group and this is what you're gonna do and it's gonna be exclusive. No, no, God says, no, 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 that's not my plan. My plan is for all the earth. Say all the earth. It's for all the earth. Whoa, look at you, you're now you're getting aggressive. It's for all the earth, not for this little group. He says, I'm gonna scatter you everywhere because God is for all people. And he scatters them. God's way is a backwards way. God's plan for success, number one, is this first thing, trust. At the very cornerstone of faith is trust. We cannot step out in faith unless we have trust 
and the one that we're stepping towards into. The very definition of faith, the assurance of things hoped for, the confidence of things that I cannot see. Have you ever walked in the pitch black and you have to take, when you know the way, <laughs> you have to take one step and just pray that you're not gonna run into a tree or something. It's the cornerstone of our faith is absolutely trust. And God says, trust me, I'm a good father, I'm a good guide, trust me. Years ago, we took our kids, my two boys at the time, on a vacation, and we did all the East Coast, and then we went whitewater rafting. How many of you have gone whitewater rafting? Oh, many of you have. And I had never gone before, and so we did all kinds of stuff, and then we went on this trip. And so we're in this raft, and there's a number of us, and our boys are young. I think they were like eight and 10 or something like that. And so we get to this one part of the rapids, and the guide, she looks at us and says, okay, who wants to jump out and ride the rapids just with your life vest? And everything was silent. And then here's me, I'll do it. <laughs> so dumb. And so if you know anything about this region, I think it was called the, the New River, I think is what it is. And so I jump out and in the New River, there's just boulders underneath the water. I had no idea. I jump out, boom, right on a boulder. I'm like, this is not starting well. And she goes, okay, this is what we're gonna do. We're just gonna pull up to the rapids. I'll let you go. And then you just go through the rapids. Okay, so we go <laughs> to the rapids and the, and the raft goes this way and I go this way and I go through the rapids and I'm like, <laughs> and like, I can't breathe, I'm going underwater, it's horrible. I come out, I'm like, oh my goodness, that was worse than I thought. Our guide brings the boat around and she's like, hey, I'm really sorry, man, I dropped you in the wrong rapids. <laughs> like, I could have died. My kids could have saw me drown right in front of their eyes. I did not trust that guide for the rest of the trip. Side note, I didn't say it's in our service, but we actually saved some woman. She was in her 70s and she was in this trip and she went over the wrong rapids and we had to pull her out. Anyway, side note. So, crazy trip. But I did not trust that guy. But here's what I would tell you today. In the 20 years or so that I've been following Christ with my family and Amy, I would say this, God is fully trustworthy. We've been through a lot of rapids. Even right now, the last six months, Amy and I are in deep rapids right now. Because just because you follow God doesn't mean your life is awesome. I mean, it is awesome, but it doesn't mean it's lacking difficulty. None of us are immune from that, right? We're all in the journey of life. But what I've learned is no matter what rapids we're going through, the Lord has us no matter what. And he's saying this, listen, I am trustworthy. <laughs> Don't place your trust anywhere else other than the one that's fully trustworthy. He said, you want plan for success? That's what you need to focus on. There were a group of people that followed Jesus when he was teaching. And he had provided for them in an extraordinary way. They saw these miracles. And so he went across the lake. And that night they traveled all the way around the lake to meet him again. Because they wanted to know the secret of eternal life. And they went to him and they said, we want to know what real life is. Tell us what you have. Tell us how we get this. And there's very few times in scripture that God said, this is what God requires of you. There's just a handful of times that God says that. And this is one of those scriptures. And so they go to him at one point and they say, listen, tell us the work that you require of us. Here's one of my life verses. And he said, the work that God requires is this, to believe in the one he sent. So simple, isn't it? He said, to believe in the one he sent. If you break that down, that phrase to believe in actually means to place your trust in. It's not a belief like a passive belief, like, okay, I believe everything's gonna be all right. It's like, no, it's an active placing your trust in God. That is the core. He says, if you want real life, place your trust in me. Jesus said the same thing to his disciples, very last words when he left them. He said, all authority and power have been given to me. He says, now you, and say the word go. Now you, and therefore make all disciples of where? All nations. He says, now go. And then he follows it up at the end of the scripture. And he says, and I will be with you to the end of the age. I am trustworthy. I will be with you through everything. I'll be with you to the very end of the age. God's plan for success, first one is trust him. Second one, worship. Worship God. I don't know if you know this today, but all of us in this room, everyone around the world worships something. 
In fact, I would say it's in our DNA. It's how we were designed. We were designed to worship something. I mean, I don't know, some of you worship your Xbox. Some of you worship your PlayStation. Some of you worship sports. Some of you worship your family. Some of you worship your children, your job, your status, your ability. And God's saying, listen, you were created to worship, but when your worship actually turns to the wrong object of your affections, you will get lost. When we look at this scripture, they're worshiping their abilities. They're worshiping themselves and drawing their attention to themselves. So God says, no, worship me. I am the one that is worthy of worship. Jesus said it this way, that when you worship and you do your work, something happens. He says, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and then glorify your Father in heaven. He's saying, look, do a bunch of beautiful things, but have your worship rooted in me while you're doing those. And as you do those, when someone says, that's an amazing tower, you say, yeah, that's what God built. I did that for him. That is my act of worship. All of us have abilities that we can use to worship God with it. I don't know your abilities. I don't know what it means to worship him, but when you do, people say, wow. And you say, yeah, it's, that's God working. It's a beautiful thing. He says, trust me, worship me. And then the last one is this. Serve, serve me, serve me. I think one of the most extraordinary aspects of Christianity is this, that the one that spoke the world into existence at Christmas comes in speechless as a baby. And he says this, I didn't come here to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. That's an upside down kingdom. That is a backwards way. That the one that has all the power is willing to be powerless. The king that everyone should be serving, he goes low and serves everyone else. That is a backwards way of looking at things. That is essentially what we were talking about. That's the ultimate backwards way. And in Babel, the people's greatest fear is the very thing that God desired, to be scattered over the face of the earth. And he said, no, trust me. Him over themselves, worshiping and promoting God rather than worshiping and promoting themselves and ultimately serving others rather than serving themselves. That's what God's asking, trust, worship, serve. It's not self-protection, self-promotion, selfish desires. It's different. And so Steve Andrews, who has been a leader of this movie, and I love him. He's one of my, my, my mentors. He's, he's like a spiritual father to me. He started this movement he has absolutely drilled that into our minds in this church. He said, this is the heart of what we are. He's, I've heard him say many times, ah, Kensington will go away tomorrow, it might go away. But what we're gonna do is give everything we can away before it happens. He's like, live like this. And it's hard, believe me. Amy and I have very many times do this with our kids, with our finances, with our life. And Steve's like, whatever you do, just keep doing this. Give it away. Give it away. I love, we have a story to share with you. It's a young student, Trim Pafford. The Pafford family is an awesome family. The kids are just wonderful and gifted. And Trim came and was part of Kaleo uh, when she was just a little one. And now she's a senior in high school. I think she's 17 years old. Trin, has been, you, if you've been here before, she's led worship here. She's super powerful when she sings and leads. It's uh, just unbelievable force. But she really came, this is one of the reasons I love our Kaleo program, because it's not just about arts, and singing and dance, of course, it's about all those things. But it's so much different than that. So much deeper than that. What they're really teaching our children is something that we don't want to hear. And here's what the principle. Your life is not your own. It's not about you. There's something bigger. And Trin, as a very little one, started to catch that vision. And now, at 17, she is leading in a way that I think is so extraordinary and so inspiring. So take this in and watch how she trusts God worships God and serves God and what that means to her and to our community. So Trin, um, I've known you for quite a long time now. You've been doing Kaleo with us for years. When did you start? You were in what grade? Fourth grade. 
And what was that performance? Do you remember? It was Turkey Trot. It was yes, Thanksgiving it was performance, trot. yes. What was your first time doing Cleo like? I was like obviously a little nervous, but when I heard that I got the singing solo, I was like, what? Like, there's no way, like, I got it. And I was so, so excited for it. I remember going on stage and not feeling nervous at all, just feeling super comfortable on the stage, even though there was, like, so many people in the crowd. And I was like, this is so fun. And I just had fun with it. Come on, let's turkey. I don't think there was any like pressure of being perfect. Like I don't think I felt any of that. It was just more of like a fun time for me to express what I love doing. You know, you mentioned that when you came, you just kind of felt comfortable. Can you talk about like what Kaleo is like as far as feeling like you belong, the community part of it? Yes. I think Kaleo, the cool thing about it is it's not just like singing, dancing, or acting. It's like a community, it's not a camp, it's more of like a family, I would say, because the main focus of Kaleo is, well, one, to make kids feel special and know that they are loved and that they have a place, like they have a voice. And so I feel like Kaleo brings that out of people through singing and dancing and acting, which is so special and there's nothing like that. There's three rules with Kaleo. It's just be respectful, listen, and have fun. And those three things definitely came across when we, they were teaching us stuff. And I think the fun part of it was very important because I think sometimes at school and at home, there's that pressure on us to like do well in this and be the best in this. But at Kaleo, it was just like to have fun and be with your friends. And it was really just doing the best that you can, but not making it perfect, just having fun with it. When you come to Kaleo, it's for elementary school kids and they get to do music, dance, and drama, as well as the community time. What is the community time like? Community time is this short amount of time that we all come together and someone's teaching a lesson in a really, really fun way. Sometimes there's a game um, and we always have a memory verse with hand motions that the kids can do and it's a time for all of us to come together and just learn how they are as an individual and as a child of God. Okay, so what are your favorite memories in Kaleo over the years? Brazil was one of them. We got to go to Brazil together. And I think I was in eighth grade. It was my first time going outside of the country. I think it was really cool to see how even kids outside of the US still respond to music and singing the same way. The heart of Kaleo like, was still there and still present and we got to share that with the kids. So one of the new things you know, we started doing with Kaleo is creating school partnerships so that we can take Kaleo outside of Kensington and out into the local schools. So the word Kaleo means to invite. So what does that mean to you? What have you, how have you seen that played out? It gives a chance for kids who are kind of in the area but don't have that access to music and the arts. I've just witnessed so many people creating new friendships because of how we're inviting people together. One of the things we value in Kaleo obviously is leadership and drawing that out in children so that they can see themselves as a leader among their peers at school or in their families or neighborhoods. Is that something that you feel um, you got from this program? Yes, for sure. I think, because I was only in Kaleo for like two years and I was really involved with it after um, being a K crew and now being like a teacher. I think my leadership st skills definitely started in Kaleo because I remember like the impact it made on me and how much I enjoyed it and so and I remember the teachers and how they taught and I was like that I want to do that like for kids and so I think that's why I'm so invested like in the program I'm still with it now and it's cool to build these relationships with these kids because it's like I've seen them grow now like how you've seen me and so that's just like the really cool part of it, about it I just want to give back like how it's impacted me. This <laughs> remarkable arts Jesus movement has taken place in the lives of kids. 
It's grown from Kensington campuses into under-resourced communities, into elementary schools all over the area, and starting to expand even beyond that. And everywhere you see it happening, it's like Jesus is alive. He's alive in the lives of people, adults that are leading, kids that are learning, kids that are doing far more than they ever imagined that they can do. Yeah, it's crazy as a teacher to see someone start, you know, at that age of what, eight or nine, yeah. and be surprised at this beautiful voice and this, you know, kind, pleasant person, but then start to see um, this like leader, you know, coming out of you. Yeah. And to be able to be a part of that journey and give you those opportunities, I've just seen your responsibility grow and your communication when you're teaching. Um, and it's just been so fun just to see every opportunity you're given, you just kind of take it and are so beyond your years because you um, really do embrace each moment. So it's fun to see. I don't know if there's ever been a time where the next generation is longing more for a deeper blessing. Like to know that their identity is not rooted in superficial things like fashion or temporary achievements, but that their worth is really planted in the nature of God's love and Jesus Christ's care for them. And so when I see a whole army of Kensington people pouring into the lives of the next generation, it gives me hope that people will know they're valued. And not only that they're valued, but that they're gonna pass that value on to generation upon generation. So when you make a year-end Christmas gift to Kensington, you have an opportunity to pass something on of substance to the next generation that cultural trends can't take away, superficial promises can't rob you from, but it's a gift to say, no, you're valuable because Jesus Christ is alive. He loves you and he's made you a person with great potential and great value. And so you learn that and you know that, and then you give that to the next generation. Let's invest to see God do that in generations to come. Isn't that awesome? Um, you know, I, I think is Trin, are you here? Yeah, you're, you're there. Why don't you stand up, Trin? Give Trin a big hand. She's... You know, Trin... A couple of things you may not know about Trin, but... Uh, you know, for me, I'm watching Trin since she's just been a little one. Man, I'll tell you what, that you, I know your heart. I know your passion for Jesus. When I was 17, you're 17. When I was 17, I was not like that. Uh, I was not thinking about the things that you're thinking about. And she is such a powerful leader. She sees the world, even in eighth grade, going to Brazil and seeing how God's working throughout the world. Uh, and boy, I, and, and what you might not know about her, she is a force in her high school. She is just a force really bringing the truth and bringing the kingdom. She caught that vision of not, not, it's not building her kingdom, but God's kingdom wherever she goes. She's a kingdom builder. And so that's where we really uh, invite everyone into, all of them. So it's just been a beautiful, a beautiful morning. Now, hey, I, I, I agree with Steve. The ushers are coming down. They're going to bring out these, these booklets. I, I would love for everyone to take this booklet, look through this booklet. Uh, I don't know if you're like me, but I've been getting a ton of emails saying, would you partner with me financially at the end of the year for this? This, for this, that uh, mission. Uh, really, from my, from my angle, I, I have no uh, apologies. I, it, it is my privilege to come and ask this community to invest in building the kingdom of God. And when you look through this booklet, you're going to see really our heart. You're gonna see our heart for our region, for the states, and for the world. And then in the back, if you just turn towards the back, there's a list of things that are very practical. If you give to this, this is what this means. And so I'd love for you to take this. And we do something at Kensington, if you've never heard this, we say we always ask God, do the dangerous prayer. Hold this, talk it with your family, with your uh, significant other, and then just pray and say, God, what would you have for us? And then you do what he asks you to do. Uh, so thank you for that. Well, our students are gonna lead us in this last moment. We're gonna hear some testimonies of how God's speaking through them, and then they're gonna lead us in one last song. Take it away. I have learned so much this semester. The Galatian memory verse is special in my part in my heart, especially the part that says, use your freedom as an opportunity to serve others with love. 
The backwards way shows that you can care for someone and not expect something in return. I recently saw a student having a rough day at school. Now seeing nothing seemed to go going right for her, I decided to let her go in first for a presentation instead of thinking about myself going first. Taking a few seconds to put others can turn a person's day around for the better. The Gordon community taught the importance of being a giver. We gave pins to people to show how much we care. I gave my first pin to one of my best friends, Olivia. She always helps me when I need help. She stands up for me when I feel like I don't fit in. She always has my back when things go backwards for me. I have her back in the same way. I gave her the pin to remind her how much her kindness means to me and to remind me to always think of the backwards way to serve others with Jesus in my heart. The backwards way means to me that you do everything the way that God would want you to. An example of this happened to me when I was at Spring Hill overnight camp. I got all harnessed up to go on the zip line and was really excited to go on it. I climbed up to the top, but when I got there, I was really nervous. Everyone else in my small group had already went down, and my leader and I were the only ones left. At this time, a group of three boys and their leader came up for their turn. That leader overheard me telling my struggle to my leader about being scared to go on it. He took the time to encourage me and help me by saying these words I will never forget. He said, through God, you can do anything. He prayed with me right there and told me that God will be right by my side every step of the way. That was what I needed, and I ended up going down. Let's just say it turned out to be the best part of camp for me. Always remember the little things you do can make a huge difference in someone's life. This leader really helped me face my fears by simply stopping and taking time to talk with me. Society says to focus on ourselves with well, the backwards way looks at those around us and finds ways to give love, serve, and help others. Sorry. Even when you told you're not enough even when you find it's hard to keep your head up from shame Even when all your faith is lost Just don't give up, no, just don't give up Cause love is a miracle worker Love is living inside of you Love is, love is a miracle worker
awesome. So good. Sydney. Awesome job, awesome job, awesome job. Hey, everyone, get close, get close, get close. Hey, this is Sydney. Uh, we asked Sydney to end in prayer, so we would like her to lead us in that. So everyone, come up close, come up close. Oh, you want to get, there we go. Come around in here. This is awesome. Really cool. This is so good. Great job, Lydia. Go ahead. Go ahead, Sydney. Dear Lord, thank you for um, everyone here. Um, I hope that um, um, that you continue giving us blessings, and thank you for um, everything you do. Thank you for um, all the happeni ha happiness that you give us. Um, thank you for everything you give us, and I hope that people far, far away who have houses made out of straw and um, who don't have clean drinking water have fresh drinking water and houses made out of brick and wood. Mm. Um, amen. Amen. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Well, thank you for being part of this. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Um, give these guys one more big hand and have a great weekend. Awesome job. Awesome job. You guys want to go out in the corner? Look out, buddy. <laughs> <laughs>